We're in an end game for the second industrial revolution, a very torturous and very, very scary next 30 years. We now know the outer limits of how far we can globalize this world based on elite fossil fuels. We need a new economic vision for the world that's compelling. We need a new economic game plan for the world that's deliverable and shift us from geopolitics and ideological thinking to biosphere consciousness. New energy regimes make possible more complex civilizations. They change the energy flow. They bring more people together. They differentiate skills. They integrate people into larger economic and social units. It's when energy and communication revolutions come together that we change the human footprint. We change the economic paradigm. We even change consciousness. I started my vocational life pretty much as a creature of the oil industry. I taught at the Royal School of Mines at Imperial College, trained young geologists for the oil and gas industry, coal industry. And that led me to become an environmental campaigner in the second phase of my life. I still see myself as an environmental campaigner because in the third phase I set up a renewable energy company. We're very bullish about being able to run the world entirely on renewable energy. And as time goes by, the more compelling our case becomes. I mean, especially when you look at countries like Germany, where Deutsche Bahn have targets and timetables, if you'll pardon the pun, for running the German railways entirely on renewables. If you take the full family of renewables, solar, wind, the marine technologies, the biomass, biofuel technologies, you mix and match so that you compensate for the weaknesses of each technology. Solar doesn't work at night and the rest of it. You can power the world this way. One of the things I've learned in my 12 years of being a nominally successful capitalist within the system is that uh, you, you know we're, we're not going to be able to evolve our way to this, to this change. The, institutional defense of the status quo by um, that nexus of big energy and conventional capital is so strong it's going to have to be forced on them and the way to do that is the kinds of social movements we're seeing the community energy movement the um, occupy movement this is brixton energy solar one decentralized cooperatively owned community renewable energy the project started about 13 months ago and it involved local members of the community who were really concerned about the way money worked and about peak oil and about social welfare. And they came together to try to figure out how they could work on a, a solar project but also to facilitate community involvement. We have local community members who've invested their money into this project and they know that there's more than just a financial return. They know that there's a social dividend as well. Whereas in the city, you have 90% of the global investment is tied to fossil fuels. The stock exchanges of the world are stuffed with companies uh, who measure their assets in carbon, in coal, oil and gas. 30% of the FTSE 100 now measures uh, its value in uh, coal, oil and gas. This is decentralized, cooperatively owned, renewable energy where the local people invest. They want a long-term return, which is gonna help their community to develop. And that's why they all come together to do this. And it's very different from this global, centralized system in fossil fuels. Green Energy Nayland is a cooperatively owned energy company within the village of Nayland. The first site that we had was the school. It's perfectly south-facing, perfect pitch on the roof, and a very interested and active eco team at the school and headmistress. The way of working in our school is to, to listen to people. So we listened to, uh, to one of our parents um, who told us we had a perfect roof for solar power. Um, our eco team, who are a group of children in the school who come up with initiatives to make us a greener school, um, listened to this parent and then came to me and basically said, we need PV on our roof, we have the perfect roof. We had all the right ingredients to make that project work. We held two public meetings in the village and in three weeks, we'd raised £36,000, I think it was. All the benefits of the scheme go into the local community. So within the school, the school gets a reduced energy bill because it gets the solar energy. This scheme went live with the higher tariffs, um, but obviously the cost of solar was higher. But 
the return is still, um, we're talking sort of six, seven percent um, a year on your investment. There's a lot of potential with these schemes, especially as bank interest rates and equity um, investments now are so volatile. I think these schemes actually seem quite a sound investment. The problem we've got is that actually if you read the UK's renewable energy strategy, these schemes are absolutely vital in order for them to meet their targets. And no E.ON or EDF is going to come to Nayland School and say, can I put solar panels on your roof? Economically, nuclear power doesn't make a lot of sense. It takes too long to bring on stream by their own admission, the industry's admission. I'm Jenny Lally. I work for EDF Energy and I'm currently on the graduate scheme. The timescale for nuclear reactors to actually be commissioned and actually give out power is quite a long time. It could be like 10 to 12 years. We don't have 10 years to deal with some of our energy supply problems and our climate change problem. Currently there are 450 nuclear reactors in the world producing 6% of the energy need and by 2050 this is expected to rise to 20%. I think this is achievable. Um, it will take a lot of time and effort on different companies' behalfs, but I think, especially in developing countries, nuclear is a very good way forward. Replacing sort of every ageing nuclear power plant and building an additional thousand to accomplish this task would require construction of three power plants every 30 days for the next 40 years. Is that possible? That sounds like an awful lot, so I wouldn't like to say. You can't understate how powerful the big energy lobby is. Uh, when you look at um, life as an official in one of these ministries in the Department of Energy or the Department of Business, and you think that they're surrounded by uh, getting on for 50 officials from the big energy companies full-time on secondment, implanted into these ministries. And that's before you've considered BP and Shell and what they spend their money on. These are very powerful forces that are lined up behind the status quo. And as time goes by, to me, it often feels like civil war. So the closer we get to grid parity, the closer we get to providing solar electricity cheaper than conventional electricity, for example, that is coming. That's an inevitability. It's just a question of when. And with each month, we get closer. And what happens, as I experience it, there's a bigger pushback from big energy. BP, for example, pulled out of solar globally altogether in December last year. Why would they do that when the costs are coming down so much? Why choose now? And you think they're over there in Whitehall telling uh, government officials and ministers it's a good idea to go with solar? I don't think so. They're arguing for gas. They're arguing for fracking. They're telling those people that, you know, that, that gas can uh, have a resurgence and, and power uh, Europe in a way that means you don't need renewables at all. That's what gas lobbyists tell the government. I know that because government officials tell me that's what they're being told. I agree with the media concept that renewables can't work alone as they stand at the moment. More research needs to go into them in order for them to stand alone. Um, at the moment, they're just not a very secure supply to the fact that it, the wind farms are only going to work when the wind is blowing, the solar farms are only going to work when it's sunny. The problem is that there's a lot of mainstream media still um, peddling kind of the fact that business as usual is fine, we can continue just digging coal and getting gas from magic places and doing all of those things and we're all going to be fine. Actually, the bottom line is that isn't the case. Yeah, I think, you know, the, um, the slipstream benefit list from going renewables is, is really long. Never mind about climate change, never mind about energy security, it's not though, as though they weren't reasons enough. You've then got clean air and all the health benefits that come from that. You've got much less use of water in a world where water supplies are being depleted dramatically than you would have with fossil fuels and nuclear. You've got no reason to go to war in the Middle East. Uh, and you've also got all the benefits that come from a renaissance of community. Once you've got renewable power at the community level, you've got community level economic activity that really, to me, make this a no-brainer. We have to change consciousness. We have to move from a geopolitical ideological frame to biosphere consciousness in order to have the narrative and the vision and the determination and the will and the drive to move ahead instead of through fear backing up to the 20th century. 
We have enough distributed energy to provide for our species until kingdom comes. The European Union has committed itself to a five-pillar infrastructure for a third industrial revolution. I was privileged to develop the plan with the EU. It was formally endorsed by the Parliament in 2007. Pillar one, the European Union's committed to, as you know, 20% renewable energy by 2020. That means a third of the electricity in Europe has to be green. That's a mandate, not a suggestion. Everyone has to do it. Pillar two, to convert every single existing building into your own green micro power plant. So you can get photovoltaics and capture the sun on your roof, vertical wind to capture the wind off the side walls of your building, geothermal heat pumps under the ground, garbage converted back to energy, the works. Think centralized power and utility companies today, think the next 20 years, everyone's gonna have their own power plant. Just like we produce information, we now produce our own energy. And there are already millions of people doing it. And the minute we start pillar one and two, we have millions of jobs overnight. In Germany, they created hundreds of thousands of jobs just in the first few years, only in pillar one. And now pillar two, they're creating more. Then the question is, how do we store the energy? Pillar three, because the sun isn't always shining here in London, as we know. But we're putting most of our emphasis at the center of the storage network in hydrogen. Simply, it's the basic element of the universe. It's what we're made out of. It carries other energies. And it's completely transformable from one form to another on carrying energy. And it's modular, so you can put a little hydrogen storage technology in your flat or in a big utility company. Pillar four, this is where the nervous system of this new infrastructure is created, where the communication revolution, the internet, merges with distributed energies. We take off-the-shelf internet technology, off-the-shelf. We take the transmission and power grid of the European Union, and then every continent in the world, and we transform that power grid to an energy internet that acts exactly like the internet. So when millions of buildings are collecting green energy on site, storing it in hydrogen, like we store media in digital, and then if you don't need some of that and someone else somewhere else needs it, your software can program it so you send that energy across that energy internet from the Irish Sea to the doorsteps of Russia. Pillar five, transport. Electric vehicles came out this year. Hydrogen fuel cell cars, buses, and trucks in mass production in 2014. Daimler, GM, Toyota, it's already in production line. We'll be able to plug in our electric and fuel cell vehicles anywhere in the infrastructure and get green electricity from our buildings. Then wherever we travel, we can stop, connect back into the grid, and get electricity. Or let's say you're at home studying and your car's sitting out there. Program the software on the computer, and if the electricity goes up on the grid, it'll click on your computer, and you'll sell your electricity back to everybody else. You make money while you're doing nothing. It's the synergies between the five pillars that create the infrastructure, the nervous system for a new paradigm. We've democratized the ability to share information at almost zero transaction cost around the world. That's dramatic. But it's only part one of the story. Part two is when that internet technology democratizes energy and makes it so cheap that we can share it collaboratively across continents like we share information online. Then we have a revolution. There are future generations of human beings and creatures not yet here. They deserve their moment in a flourishing planet. Our job is to make sure that they have that moment in the sun. One of the sad things about, about all this is that, I hope I'm wrong here, but you know, I don't think we're going to win the arguments. I think we're just going to find out who's right. Uh, and that's the bad news. And the bad news is that I do think uh, people like me who worry about peak oil are going to be proved right and that there will be a massive third global energy crisis. Now, the good news, I think, is that when that happens, when we get that stress imposed upon us in society, when the arguments are over, as it were, as they were in the credit crunch, you know, it became obvious at, some, at a certain point that the investment bankers and all those people in the incumbency had got their arguments catastrophically wrong. And we will have to mobilize energy technologies quickly 
uh, and that will discount nuclear power straight away. But we'll be talking about energy efficiency, we'll be talking about renewable energy technologies, and we'll be under pressure in the way that my parents' generation was under pressure in the run-up to the Second World War. And lo and behold, they amazed themselves at how quickly they could mobilise bombers and tanks and warships and all the rest of it. Uh, and I think that is how the drama is going to play out on our watch. Beyond that, there really is the scope for renaissance, and that's when we'll really be tested. And I'm very bullish about what clean energy technologies can do for energy and beyond for wider society when that day comes.